In today's lab, we will be talking about creep testing. And you have understood what creep is in, in our previous course. The machine on which we performed the low cycle fatigue test at high temperature did involve some amount of creep deformation also in the specimen. So creep basically is a time dependent deformation and it happens in metallic material at higher temperature and it happens in polymers, can happen in some of the polymers at room temperature, in some of the metals also at room temperature. For example, in lead it can happen, creep can happen at room temperature. In, on ice it happens uh, at sub-zero temperatures and this phenomena is general and it is it, it, it can simply be viewed as that something is flowing uh, and you make it so viscous so viscous by stopping the movement and how do you stop the movement and how something is moving and, and why something so why atoms are moving in a different way at a lower temperature and why these atoms are moving in a in a fluid way uh, when the temperature goes higher and how high this temperature is and and why it does happen and well then what does that but what does that mean or why are they doing that or how are they doing it uh, you're asking. I, I, I must say, I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. Of course, it's ask. a reason. It's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, the, but the problem that you're asking, you see, when you ask why something happens, how does a person answer why something happens? For example, Aunt Minnie is in a hospital. Why? Because she slipped. She went out and she slipped on the ice and broke her hip. That satisfies it, people. It satisfies, but it wouldn't satisfy someone who came from another planet and knew nothing about things. You first, you should understand why, when you break your hip, do you go to the hospital? How do you get to the hospital with the, when the hip was broken? Well, because her husband, seeing that she had the hip was broken, called the hospital up and sent somebody to get her. All that is understood by people. Now, when you explain a, a why, you have to be in some framework that you allow something to be true. Otherwise, you're perpetually asking why. Why did the husband call up the hospital? Because husband is interested in his wife's welfare. Not always. Some husbands aren't interested in their wife's welfare when they're drunk and they're angry. And so you begin to get a very interesting understanding of the world and all its complications. In order to, to if you try to follow anything up, you go deeper and deeper in various directions. If, for example, you could go, well, why did she slip on the ice? Well, ice is slippery. Everybody knows that. No problem. But you ask, why is ice slippery? That's kind of curious. Ice is extremely slippery. It's very interesting. You say, how does it work? You could, you see, so you could either say, I'm satisfied that you've answered me. Ice is slippery. That explains it. Or you could go on and say, why is ice slippery? And then you're involved with something because there aren't many things as slippery as ice. It's very hard to get greasy stuff, but that's sort of wet and slimy. But a solid that's so slippery? Because it is in the case of ice that when you stand on it, they say, momentarily the pressure melts the ice a little bit, so you got a sort of instantaneous water surface on which you're slipping. Why on ice and not on other things? Because ice expands when it, water expands when it freezes, so the pressure tries to undo the expansion and melts it is capable of melting it, but other substances contract when they're freezing and when you push them they're just as satisfied to be solid. Why does water expand when it freezes and other substances don't expand when they freeze? All right, I'm, I'm not answering your question, but I'm telling you how difficult a why question is. You have to know what it is that you're permitted to understand and allow to be understood and known and what it is you're not. You'll notice in this example that the more I ask why, it gets interesting after all. That's my idea that the deeper a thing is, the more interesting it is. And uh, we could even go further and say, why did she fall down when she slipped? That has to do with gravity. It involves in all the planets and everything else. Never mind. It goes on and on. 
So that was Richard Feynman answering why magnets repel each other and he uh, kind of was answering that how deep the person wanted to know why things are happening. So in the creep test as you know that uh, when we apply a constant load we can apply a constant force also sorry uh, constant stress also but uh, applying a constant stress would need a feedback from the specimen constantly to understand how much area has uh, decreased and based on that the force has to be decreased in order to maintain the same stress because you know stress is force divided by so force per unit area. Therefore the, the whole structure of the machine for a creep test will be same as you had in the low cycle fatigue test it can be done on the same machine. So you put this specimen, the specimen also looks like that and the older specimen used to look in a different way and creep test can take a lot of time it can take more than 100 days and sometimes it has taken for the sake of research more than 10 years also so when you perform such kind of test you cannot rely on electric supply constantly uh, in in third world country of course you cannot rely on the electricity even for smaller days and uh, even even in a first world country that is that is something which is very risky so the older creep machine creep testing machine used to be mechanical completely mechanical so you hang you hang the specimen so you hang the specimen and the rod stands on a fulcrum like this and you hang the specimen from one end and you apply the weight on another end and that much amount of force is applied on the specimen the, the lower part of the specimen is fixed of course so the specimen lower part is fixed and upper part is attached to this rod and then the other part is connected with this one where you have the force and that force is uh, trying to pull this rod down and because of that you have force on this one and that pulls the specimen up. So then you uh, measure the displacement on the, on the specimen and from the displacement you calculate the strain and then you see that under the constant application of load the strain increases with time so you are not changing force but still the displacement is changing this is happening because material is flowing and the material is flowing because it is at higher temperature the movement differs because the atomic vibrational energy changes with the change in temperature atoms can move in a in a higher amplitude with a higher uh, frequency at higher temperature and that causes the materials to flow differently which is uh, reciprocated in the solid material crystalline material in the form of dislocations the dislocations so different phenomena because at higher temperature you will have more concentration of vacancy equilibrium number of vacancy in the system and these vacancies can help dislocations to move in a different uh, non-conservative movement which is climb so a dislocation which has got stuck at a barrier this barrier can be a precipitate it can be a particle it can be grain boundary it can be any barrier which doesn't allow the dislocation to move so it can be a lumer cotral barrier and uh, and and this dislocation which is blocked can surpass it by climbing so it climbs it scales up on on different planes by leaving a vacancy down and because it can generate more so more vacancies are allowed at higher temperature so this will help this phenomena of climb and the dislocation will pass this barrier and it will move therefore you don't need much stress to unlock this dislocation because dislocations are getting locked of course because of their movement but they are also getting unlocked because of the higher temperature and availability of the vacancies so this is, uh, uh, this is something which happens at a comparatively lower temperature but if you keep on increasing the temperature or if you do the test at a very high temperature for metallic materials it would be uh, in the range of 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius if you do it there then the grains which are in the systems they so the grain boundary uh, grain boundary have atoms which are which doesn't have to follow any rules so they are they're completely free so that's why we call it very high energy area also we call it very high um, uh, disordered or amorphous part of the crystalline body 
So, this this uh, so two grains are there and between those two grains there is an amorphous part which acts like a fluid uh, at higher temperature because of course the atoms are there and they are able to move very fast because they they do not have any rule to follow because they are not in a crystalline they are not in they are not a part of the ordered system as long as they are in the grain boundary and this uh, at higher temperature allows them to move much faster. So, grain boundary diffusion coefficient will also be much higher at higher temperature and because of this very fast movement these grains can flow like this rotate like this. So, this is called grain boundary sliding which happens at a comparatively higher temperature. So, these are the phenomena of creep which have which we have understood in our course previous in the previous semester and machine is exactly similar to low cycle fatigue. You will uh, see the machine in the in the video in the pre recorded video and this video is from uh, 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 is not from our institute, but it will show you the same phenomena. In a, in a way which is understandable. So, basically the specimen is exactly similar to what we tested in the low cycle fatigue test in, in our previous experiment and this specimen will be uh, inside the furnace as you saw in the last experiment. So, this will be in the furnace and then there will be the exact same extensometer which we used in the low cycle fatigue test. And you will not apply any strain amplitude. So, that will be the difference and here you will just apply a constant force and based on that constant force you will calculate the strain, the displacement and time as a result and from those values you will be doing the analysis. So, the data I will share you in the next uh, lab. So, next week and this week you only go through the process of the testing and a little bit about the theory and you do not have to write the report for the next week. Next week when you have the data you do the analysis and then you write the complete report on the creep testing and you write about the, the, the introduction in which you explain why creep is important and why do we study it and where is the application of the creep testing and then you uh, explain about the experimental procedure explaining how we put the sample and how we apply the force and what do we get from the machine and then our, and other integrate details which you will see in the video and after that you uh, write about the results about the material which uh, was tested about the specimen uh, dimensions and the results you can plot in, in, a, in a nice way so with the axis names and curve and then from that you can calculate uh, the minimum creep rate. So, when you are plotting strain versus time you know what is delta epsilon by delta t. So, that will be the creep rate and you know that there are three stages primary, secondary, tertiary. The secondary one there is, uh, there is so in the primary one you have strain hardening. So, the strain goes, uh, strain has a slope higher. So, the strain rate will go down. And in the secondary stage there is a balance between two phenomena. So, there is dynamic recovery going on because of higher temperature and there is also strain hardening going on. So, these two uh, these two opposite mechanisms. So, these mechanisms the outcome of these mechanisms are opposite in nature one will be increasing strength and another will be decreasing it. They balance each other out and that is why you get a strain rate which is minimum. So, it, it becomes in, in some cases it becomes completely flat or it has a very 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 small slope meaning that the rate of change of a strain in the secondary stage of creep is the minimum and this is the design parameter this is what is used to understand that this material can take the deformation of creep to what extent. So, you will be calculating this minimum creep rate or you will be calculating the creep rate of the whole curve whole epsilon you have epsilon that means strain and time and from that you can calculate what will be the strain rate you can plot the strain rate and you can tell if there is a minimum or not and what is the value of the minimum creep rate. So, that will be the whole experiment which you will be submitting uh, next to next week. So, next week you will have the experimental data and another week you will have uh, you will have to submit the report and on that week we will be doing some other test. Okay, so watch the video explaining the experimental setup and how it is done. 
and good luck. So in this video you will see the furnace which is similar to our furnace in the last uh, test where we did low cycle fatigue testing and in this you have induction coils and thermocouples attached at three different places. The specimen is put in an adapter which is similar to ours in the last experiment and then you put the extensometer which is exactly same as it was in the our previous test but the mechanism to hold it is a little different here you put these uh, high temperature coated wires which which hold the extensometer so you don't need an external frame which was in the last machine in the, in the previous test and you close the temperature and then you have to apply a little amount of preload if there is any thread which is missing or loose the specimen is if there is any misalignment then that should be taken care of by application of a very small amount of load and whatever displacement happens that you make it zero by doing zero correction so you just set it to have a value of zero so in this case you see there is a 0.15 kilonewton of uh, force applied which is the preload and then test load value is 2 kilonewton so the test is going to be performed at 2 kilonewton and the temperature is 750 degrees celsius and uh, the maximum limit load and there are some safety things so here you see the temperature shoots up and the force is 0.5 kilonewton fluctuates somewhere in that range you know when the temperature will, will shoot up there will be a thermal expansion and because of that uh, there might be a force so because you have applied a force this actuator will move uh, with thermal expansion because if it if the sample is expanding then there will be a compressive force on the specimen if the actuator doesn't move so you have applied a preload of 0.5.15 kilonewton because of which the actuator will move up so here in the furnace you set the temperature 750 degrees celsius and you start the furnace and with the symbol of burning you see that the furnace is hot you also see the actuator the adapter the specimen red and then these are the thermocouples which have ceramic tubes around it for the safety from the temperature and that's how it goes inside and you see the adapter and sample and three thermocouples attached on the top bottom and center are all red because of the high temperature you don't perform the test like this in this video it is just shown to you by opening the furnace that how hot it is at 750 degrees celsius <clears throat> and these are the adapters and after that you will see at the end of the test that the specimen will be broken you see how the extensometer is attached with the specimen and now the specimen is broken and with this the experiment ends and you will have the data from which you can calculate the minimum creep rate.